a, a book reader or not? I mean, I know some of us are, are book readers and things have kind of changed, but how many of you love to, to read books? You love to read, okay? And when I say read, I mean like actually read. So, so you, read, you read the book or you read you know, on Kindle, right? Less hands, so help me out. You read? Okay. So when you hear read, does that sometimes mean like audiobooks too? Yeah? Nothing wrong. There's, there's no, no reason to be ashamed. Who loves audiobooks? I love audiobooks. Right? Who loves books with pictures? Okay. Books with no words, all pictures. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. This picture paints a thousand words, so it's like reading, sort of. Well, a lot of us may, may like books or love books or be interested in books for a particular reason, whatever the thing is that we have where we have a passion, but it's information. And really, for the most part, it is just information. But notice again our text in James 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. And so this is something different. It's not just uh, be doers of a book and not just hearers only, but be doers of the word. And the word we know is the Bible. And the Bible is in fact the word of God. Let me read this to you. First Thessalonians 2 verse 13, Paul was writing here to the church in Thessalonica and he wrote, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Now, now don't miss this because you know, we hear these types of truths so many times they become commonplace for us. Notice again the encouragement as he's encouraging them, a group of people who heard the word, they were given the word, they had been waiting for it like anybody in their day because they didn't have a complete Bible yet. And so they received these words as letters, but they were the word from God to the church. And so for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, meaning we are always grateful that you're learners, Paul says. Now remember, he commended them, the church of Thessalonica. He said they were more noble than those from another place because they received the word gladly, but they also searched the scripture. So these were men and women who loved God's word. They had a passion for God's word. Do you have a passion for his word? I mean, think through that word, I mean, a passion, not just an interest or, you know, some type of intrigue, but a passion for his word, where you study it and you want to understand it, you want to know it, you want to own it, understanding that the difference between knowing it and owning it is when you understand what it is and you apply it to your life. That's what these people were all about. For this reason, we, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men. Why would he say that? Because there were people who simply saw it as the word of men. There were people who saw it as a book. But notice, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. We need to be people like that that acknowledge that God's word is very unique. You see, Hebrews 4 verse 12 says that the Bible um, speaks of itself and, and calls itself the word of God. And it tells us that, that the word of God is living and active. So it's described there as a sword, but it's, it's declared to be the word of God, but it's living, so it's spiritually alive is the idea. And it's also powerful or active or effectual. You see, the Bible is more than a book. It's more than a book you read. It's a book that reads you. And this book that, that reads you and reads me does much more than that. You see, the Bible describes itself as silver and gold and treasure because it's so valuable, because it's priceless. But it's described as milk and honey and solid food and spiritual food because it feeds us and it nourishes us. It gives us strength. It's described as cleansing water because it washes us. It cleanses our mind and causes us to be renewed day by day. Amen? And we need that because we have a world that's, that's filthy. I mean, there's stuff everywhere, whether it's on you know, your computer or on your phone or whether it's in billboards or just you know, people you pass along the way. 
We need our minds cleansed, and God's word does that for us. It's described as saving water. So a water that, that actually saves. So it cleanses us to the, to the deepest part of who we are. It's irrigating water that allows for things to grow. So it causes growth in our life. And of course, it's a seed that's planted. So that seed that's planted bears fruit. It's a goad that pushes us along or moves us in the direction that we're supposed to go when we find ourselves moving a little bit slower than we should be moving. It's also a sure foundation we can build our life upon. You know, we don't have that anywhere else. We have opinions, we have philosophies, we have ideas, we might even have experiences, but those things aren't things that we can build our life upon. Those certainly aren't things we can, we can trust our eternity to, but God's word is. And so we can literally take God's word and everything it says and apply it as it was intended. And our life is sure and, set and steadfast. So it's a, a sure foundation. It's a hammer. The Bible describes itself as a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces, meaning it's not just a hammer for building, it's a hammer for breaking. So I like that because it's one thing to build, which, which is fun to build, but man, it's more fun to break stuff. Right? And I'll tell you what, God loves breaking things in our life that are not good. And he loves going to work on a hard heart. And God can work on a hard heart and he can save the hardest person. I know that. He saved me. And so God's word is like a hammer. It's like a well-driven nail in Ecclesiastes 12. It's a burning fire. It's a refining fire. It's a light. And it's also a lamp described in Psalm 119, which is a beautiful personal lamp. It's a small thing that would fit in the palm of your hand and it directs you where you need to go, but it only gives you the direction you need for about three or four feet. So in other words, just what you need for the next step. But that's God's word, it's a lamp. It's also a weapon. It's one of our weapons of warfare, and we need that. It's a powerful weapon of warfare, a spiritual weapon. It's a sword, it's a belt, holds things together but it's also, as we'll see here in James 1, a mirror. It's a mirror that reflects our condition. It shows where we are and who we are, what's going on in our life. You see, the Bible is incredible. It's not just a book. It's living and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's something that works effectually in our life. But some would say, is it really powerful? I mean, just because you say it's powerful, just because the Bible says it's powerful, does that make it powerful? Well, it's interesting to me that, that those in the world don't deny that the Bible is powerful. Even those that, that don't believe, those that might be atheists, for example, that are in charge of countries around the world today, they believe it's powerful. They believe it's powerful enough to, to make it very difficult to obtain or dangerous to obtain in 24 countries. It's illegal or highly restricted in 15 countries, it's completely 100% strictly illegal, and in some places a capital offense to hold in 13 countries. So why would they do that if it's just a book? It's not just a book, it's the Word of God. And we need to remember that it is in fact the Word of God. But it's not enough to know it, though we do need to know it. Notice what it says here again in verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Meaning we can be deceived in thinking we're good, we're in the right place, that we're okay with God because we know the word of God. So knowing God's word is not enough. We need to know it and we also need to do it. So again, how can the word of God be powerful in our lives? Because we should want to see it powerful in our lives. It's not just a book that sits on the shelf. We need to see it powerful in our lives. So how can the word of God be powerful in our lives? Two points. Number one, be hearers of the word. We need to be, as men and women, hearers of the word. Notice right there, verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. It's not saying it's wrong to be a hearer. It's saying not to be a hearer only. And so we start right there with being a hearer of the word. It goes on to say, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. The idea is this, if we are a hearer in the word, 
then we will observe things about ourselves that we need to observe. Important truths. And so we need to be, in fact, a hearer of the word, one that opens up the Bible, the word of God, and we look into it as it is a mirror, the perfect law of liberty. So it is a mirror. Now we are very acquainted with mirrors. In fact, I was looking this up earlier this week. Women look at mirrors a lot. Does that surprise anybody here? Does it surprise anybody here that men look at mirrors more? And according, <laughs> yeah, rat it out. <laughs> We're going to be talking about marriage, by the way, in a couple of weeks. <laughs> so, but here's the interesting thing. When you look at the studies about, about mirrors and men looking at mirrors more, they've included for men things that aren't mirrors. So in other words, as if to say anything where you can catch your reflection is a mirror. And guys look at each other, or themselves, I guess, apparently more than women do. Now, depending on the study, sometimes it's as much as twice as much. But let's just be nice and just say that it's roughly the same. And, <laughs> and men and women would look at themselves in some type of reflection 30 times a day. I don't know if that surprised you. That kind of surprised me. 30 times a day. So they look at themselves in some way, shape, or form in something that's reflecting. So a mirror, they gave examples. A mirror, they gave windows, of course. They said bumpers. So like you caught your reflection in the chrome of a bumper. That's, that's pretty bad, right? 30 times a day. But he, check this out. Women look at, each, at themselves for 43 minutes total. Men, for about an hour. So even if it's the, the same amount of times, which in some studies it is, in every study, guys look at themselves in more raw minutes than the women do. But here's the thing that's different. Why? And the reasons why they look at themselves is where it goes from kind of silly, funny, to serious. You see... Women, in most studies, it just declares radically that what they see they don't like. And when they're looking, they're looking out of insecurity or they're looking complaining, they're looking sometimes out of fear. They're looking, seeing negative things, seeing the worst possible view of themselves. Which is interesting because there was no reference to men finding one of those mirrors that is a magnifier and looking at those. But they're common for women. In other words, she's looking at herself, seeing herself worse than she is. And she keeps on looking and then finds other things that can reveal more. That's sad. By the way, on the male side, the male's perspective of himself when he looks at himself is almost always positive. So even if he's out of shape and he sees himself out of shape, he says, yeah, but I can still bring it, you know? So... Her view is more negative than reality. And listen, ladies, it's more negative than reality. His view is radically more positive than reality. <laughs> and yet, as a people group, we still do it. We still look at mirrors. Listen, we need truth. We need to know what is true. In his 37-year medical career, Dr. Everett O'Neill Kane had performed nearly 4,000 appendectomies, but the surgery on February 15, 1921 in New York City was different. Dr. Kane wanted to prove that local anesthesia was safe for major surgery, which at that time, an appendectomy was major. To prove his point, he volunteered to be his own patient. He laid on the operating table fixed pillows in the right position to be able to get the right angles, set up mirrors so he could see himself clearly, administered Novocaine, and completed a flawless appendectomy on himself. The Bible is like a mirror. But listen, it shows us the things that are true. It shows us exactly what is right. Not what you think, not what I think, it shows us what God knows to be true. And so 
we need the truth. The word of God reveals how we are. Notice verse 22. Notice what it says there again. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Meaning this, we could even look at the word of God and receive truth and deceive ourselves that we're okay. Simply because we looked at it and we believed it, we say, because we know it. But you only believe as much as you obey. So we might think that, that we're okay because we, we know the thing, we understand it, and we might even say that we believe, and other people might say we believe, but we could be deceiving ourselves. And so the Word of God can reveal that because if you're deceived by nature, you think you're okay because that's the nature of being deceived. And so we need something outside of ourselves to tell us, no, you're not right, you're not okay. And so we go to the Word of God, and it does, in fact, reveal to us how we are, and that's important. It reveals to us how we are. When I first got saved, I remember hearing a story. I've heard it many different ways, and you know, it might not even be true, because I've heard that it was you know, somebody sharing with Native Americans. I heard it was somebody sharing with people in Canada. I heard it was somebody sharing with people in China. I heard it was somebody people being shared with in Africa, but the bottom line is, supposedly, someone gave someone the Bible, and they read it, and they handed it back, and supposedly said, this book kicks me. And when I heard the story, it just kind of sounded like one of those stories that gets kind of thrown around, that, that kind of makes its mill, and there's stories like that with pastors that get shared that may or may not be true. And when I heard it, I, I thought the same thing, but I like the truth, that this book, it kicks me. And the person in the story didn't want it. They were giving it back. So take it back. It kicks me when I read it. And what was really important to me when I heard it was I had just gotten saved. And so I remember when it was kicking me big time. And it was kicking me in a different way. Now it was more like a love tap, you know, where before it was like a big giant boot. And I remember when I first picked it up and I was reading it, somebody asked me when they heard I was reading the Bible, because I wasn't a Christian, and they asked me, um, you know, do you feel better reading it? I thought, no, I actually feel worse, way worse. Like I knew I was a creep, like that much. And now I'm like in Matthew, I'm like, I'm like that. And then I get out of the gospels and I'm through Acts and it's, it's really bad. And by the time I got to Romans, I was desperate. You see, that's what the Bible does. It kicks you. When you read it, you're not just reading it and it reading you. It also communicates to you. You get a sense very clearly exactly where you are, and you understand that you're not okay, meaning you begin to understand how you are. That's really important. Hebrews 4, turn there with me. I want you to see it. We've quoted it many times, but, but you need to see what it's actually saying because this is what the Bible does for us. Notice Hebrews chapter 4. It says in verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful. Now, again, Hebrews 4, 12, when it speaks of the word is the logos, so the whole word, so the entire word of God. The word of God, every single portion from Genesis to Revelation, it's equal I know in our minds, we might think it's not, where we think, you know, part of it's like this, and then genealogies are like that, okay? The whole thing is inspired. Every portion is necessary for us to be healthy men and women, thoroughly equipped, as the Bible says, for every good work. Notice the word of God, verse four, or chapter four, verse 12, is living, that's spiritually alive is the idea, so it's living and powerful. Now, how many of you, just be honest with me for a moment, how many of you have read the Bible and there's times that it appears like the words are just popping off the page? Okay, praise God. It's alive. It's living and powerful. This isn't hyperbole. It's not just Jewish expression. It's alive. It's living. Now, it doesn't change. But, the application in your life may, and it changes you. So the word of God is living and powerful. Now this word for powerful is a really interesting word. The better word would be effectual here, 
What it means literally is, is to get to work in. It's a compound word. To get to work in. So in other words, when you read the word of God, it starts to go in, and as it goes in, it's alive, it starts to go to work. And if mixed with faith, and faith, of course, being defined as somebody who's not just going to say, I believe, but they're going to practice it, they're going to apply it to their life, believing upon God. When the word is mixed with faith, it gets to work in you and produces incredible fruit meaning it's powerful in your life. So the word of God is living and powerful. Notice this, sharper than any two-edged sword. Now along this line right here, so many people in times past, and sadly so many pastors have propagated this. Yes, it's like a scalpel and you go to surgery and we just talked about that surgery right there with the mirrors and all that. And so, you know, God's word you know, will excise sin out of your life. No, God's word destroys sin from your life. God's word violently deals with sin in your life. God wants you to crucify the flesh. Not get, you know, spiritual anesthesia. He wants it to die, and he wants it to die a painful death. This is not a scalpel. I don't know where that ever came from. Machaira is known in antiquity very clearly as the short sword. This was the primary weapon. Everyone had it. This is like the, the K-bar knife for the Roman. It's living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. Why two edges? Because you're going to use it with the enemies on the outside, and you're going to use it with enemy number one on the inside. That's the idea. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Don't miss this. Piercing even to the division of soul, and spirit, meaning your soul, your suke, your feelings, your thoughts, your personality, who you are, your spirit, who you are in Christ, the part of you that communicates to God. Now, it's interesting to me because so many will say in different formats, whether the forum could be in education or in church or in philosophy, wherever it might be, we can't really discern between the difference of soul and spirit. You can't, I can't, God's word can. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. Don't miss this. Joints and marrow. They're both body. Right? And is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. In other words, his word can pierce through where you are spiritually, emotionally, physically, and what you think and feel about it. As it goes on to say, it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Meaning God knows where I'm at spiritually right now. He knows where I'm at emotionally. He knows where I'm at physically. Well, I'm standing right here, but not that. The idea is physically, meaning how my health is, how my being is, so forth. All those practical things. He's involved in that. But listen, his word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of my heart. Meaning God knows what I'm thinking before I've thought it. He knows what goes deep inside of my thoughts. He knows the word that's on my tongue before I spoke it all together. And so when we approach the word of God, again, we read it, it's reading us. The word of God reveals how we are. And that's important. Verse 22 tells us that we deceive ourselves when we hear it, but we don't do it. It's a big problem. And so that would be kind of like getting a mirror and putting it out in front of you and getting a mirror that reduces you by five pounds or reduces you by 10 pounds. Now, they make mirrors that actually add five pounds and add 10 pounds. Don't know why they would do that. This is cruel. But there are some mirrors that make you look bigger. Some mirrors make you look smaller. Some mirrors make you look taller. Some mirrors make you look shorter, but not the mirror of God's word. We need truth, and God's word is, in fact, truth 
for us. And so the word of God reveals how we are. But secondly, the word of God reveals who we are. So who we are in our being. Notice verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. So in other words, he observes his natural face. He observes who he really is. The word of God reveals that. So it reveals not just how we are, but the word also reveals who we are. Now this word here for observing in verse 23 is an interesting word because the word's a compound word and what it literally means to do is to exercise the mind down. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us perhaps at first glance, to exercise the mind down. The idea is, is that you're exercising the mind as if it's all the information here that's above ground and then when you get it, it sinks in where the word's planted. If the word is a, a planted seed, according to verse 21 in the chapter, then this makes a whole lot of sense to somebody who just read verse 21. It's been implanted as a seed, and now you exercise your mind. You might put it this way, you're tilling the ground. You're tilling the ground so that it creates an environment that causes the truth to go deep. And when that happens, you own it. That's the idea. It's translated to perceive clearly. The only way we're going to perceive something clearly is for us to experience this idea of observing. So we observe. We observe clearly to see where we are. Now, it's interesting to me because in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul gives to us what we call the love chapter. Will you turn there with me, please? And we look at this chapter oftentimes in different ways. So we might look at this chapter sometimes as being what, you know, two people should share when they get married. So love is patient, love is kind. You know, everybody's like, oh, they look so beautiful. This is great as you're there to watch your friend get married. And so it's a romantic passage. Yeah, the thing is, the word love there is agape. It's not talking about romantic love. It's not even talking about friendship love. It's talking about covenant love. Some will take the passage and simply focus on the fact that it's a spiritual gift. And it doesn't just get a couple words, it gets a whole chapter. But there's more to it than just that. Because when you look through it, you can look through it thinking, oh, well, this is really great because I can see you know, like certain types of personalities in this, this idea of love. Give, let me give you an example. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now at this point, most people will stop because this is almost like separate from the other thing. So in other words, it's telling me right there in verses 1 and 3, if I don't have love, then I'm nothing. Okay, all right. I get to hear again, no, I'm nothing. Okay. But there's more. And it goes on to say this. It says, <clears throat> love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. The idea is not provoked to any emotion. Love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. And we look at that and we go, oh, I feel, I feel better. I mean, a lot of people look at this passage that way where they, they see themselves, but they see themselves kind of like in that first part, like, well, you know, that's what I, I'm not supposed to be, and here's the part that I'm supposed to be. It's not really what it's saying. Verses 1 through 3 is saying that's basically you and me all the time. That's us. And so it really kind of gets to that point, crescendos to, I'm nothing, because that's us. Verse 4 isn't just what we want to be. It's not just what our goal is to be. Listen, verse 4 is describing God is love. It's describing who God is. And this is a really important truth. It's describing who you are in Christ. 
And that should be a blind, you know, mind-blowing truth. We understand the things that are the first part of how we lack, and if this, if this, then we are nothing. It profits us nothing, and so forth and so on. We get that. We also can get the fact that these things describe God, meaning this, love suffers long. He did, still does. Love is kind, love does not envy, love does not parade itself, love is not puffed up, and it goes on. With all those things, we understand how that describes Jesus, but don't miss this. This isn't just describing Jesus, and it's not just a goal to say this is what you need to strive to be. This is who you are in Christ. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. So we are now hidden in Christ. Now, live it out. Let it show. Love suffers long. Like, oh, I suffered once. <laughs> is that the same? No. Love suffers long. Okay? Love suffers long. Love is kind. It doesn't mean nice. It means profitable. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. Love rejoices in truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. And here's the catch on this, and I think it's a key as well. When we understand that this is who we are in Christ, because he's the one who did the work to make us righteous, then we'll understand this. Whenever we're tempted to do something other than this, you know you're tempted. Because I could read through this list, and I can guarantee you, I could give you examples of times where I was failing on one side of it, and I willfully chose not to do what God's word said to do. And I know there's times that I was tempted to not do what God said to do, and I knew what this passage said, and I did it. The reason why I didn't do it was because of my sin, my old nature. The reason why I did was because of his word and my new nature. It's describing what you're made for and what I'm made for too. If we are hearers and doers of the word, this right here alone, can you imagine the power? Say you want to see you know, God's word be powerful in your life. God's word was powerful in Paul's life. And Paul now gives to the church of Corinth something that can be powerful in their life too. It goes on, and notice what it says. Where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Verse 9, for now we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, it goes on to say, then that which is in part will be done away with. That which is perfect, Jesus. When Jesus comes, that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. In other words, now we see in a mirror dimly. Is the mirror at fault? No, we're dim. We see in a mirror dimly, but then we'll see face to face. We'll see the one our heart loves. Now listen, don't miss this because he writes this letter to the church of Corinth, the place that was famous for its bronze mirrors. They were beautiful, they were expensive, and they were lousy. It distorted everybody who looked into them. And so he says, now you see in a mirror dimly. That would not be lost on them. We look at mirrors, apparently we look a lot at mirrors. Right? The bottom line is this, when we look at those mirrors, we see him perfectly. Do you know why you don't look the same as in pictures, as you do in the mirror? Because one image is reversed. So even when you look at it perfectly, you're not seeing it perfectly. And when we look into the mirror of the law, our flesh can get involved. And our flesh can get involved when we're not applying or obeying what we already saw the time before. 
And that's why it's so important for us to be hearers of the word and doers also. Because if we are hearers of the word and doers, we will not be deceived and we will be blessed in whatever we do. And listen, we look at this mirror of the word and we see what it is and it speaks to us. Let it speak. Because there's far too many people who are looking for feel-good messages. They're looking to go to church and to hear things that make them feel good because that's what they're going for. They're going to church to feel good. And if they leave and they didn't feel good, then somehow they miss something. Well, I gotta go find another church that makes me feel good. I don't wanna hear about sin. I don't wanna hear about God's commands. I don't wanna hear about how I'm failing or not measuring up. Listen, that'd be like looking at a mirror that is portraying you as skinny when you're fat or that's portraying you as clean when you're dirty. It's portraying you as being okay when you're not. We need to look at the mirror of God's word and see truth and when we get it in by hearing it, we get it out by obeying it. Amen? Would you stand with me?